السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ان الحمد للہ نحمد و نستعین و نستغفر و نعمن به و نتوکل علیہ و نعوذ باللہ من شرور انفسنا و من سیئات اعمالنا من یہدہ اللہ فلا مدل له و من یدلله فلا حادی له و نشہد ان لا الہ الا اللہ وحده لا شریک له و نشہد ان محمد عبده و رسوله The type of era that we are experiencing today is quite a unique one. The set of challenges that today's young men and women are complaining of are quite different to any set of challenges that others experienced in the past. You don't have to look far and you don't have to extend your imagination too much to realize why this is a strong argument. Just consider this. You have an endless variety of sins of all sizes, all shapes and all forms available at the click of a button, available on demand. An average 13 or 14 year old has seen more content in a week that maybe his grandfather had seen during his entire lifetime. Those who are in search for fame they don't have to do much to ca- or carry out extraordinary feats like perhaps they did a hundred years ago. All you need is a selfie stick, an internet connection, good quality camera and there is instant fame. Sins that usually needed people to participate with, to be sins in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sins like backbiting, backstabbing, slander, gossip, lying, defamation, etc. You need more than two or three people to, for that to happen. Today you don't need circumstances, you don't need too many people. In fact, you can be a backbiter, a slanderer, a thief, a liar, etc. etc. when you are by yourself. All you just need is a keyboard. This is a unique time, as I said earlier, a time of dejection, disillusionment, boasting, pride, fake news, scams, etc. Therefore, we are in a very challenging time, to say the least, and it is a unique set of circumstances that we are experiencing both as young and old. We can easily say it is impossible to deal with them impossible to manage them, to navigate them, let alone transferring them into an Islamic opportunity without the help of Allah and without triggering certain actions of the heart to help you get through them and to sail safely. Today, we want to speak of one of those actions of the heart that helps us to do so and what the scholars have described as al murakhaba meaning the watchfulness of Allah, the conscious heart. We are talking of your consciousness as a Muslim, that the watchful eye of Allah is upon you and his knowledge of you never ever fails. How do the scholars define this worship, Murakhaba? Imam Ibn al-Qayyum, he mentioned, Murakhaba is the watchfulness which is the constant state of knowledge and certainty that Allah is observing your outward and inward state. Another scholar said, it is the state of knowledge that sits in your heart and tells you that Allah is near. A person who experiences this is acting upon this phenomenal act of worship that sits in the heart. It is called murakhaba. The concept of murakhaba is very strongly intertwined with consciousness, the idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly observing you in your aim to achieve ihsan, which is excellence. What is the uppermost part of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That is, 
worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whereby you feel that you can see him but if you can't see him then know that he can see you. What we are speaking about now is not just another in the list of actions of ibadah that sit in the heart like ihsan, tawakkul, yaqeen, etc. We are talking of murakhaba, the base from which every action of the heart stems. Being conscious of his watchful eye that never sleeps and ihsan, the highest part of your religion is the basis of all actions of your inward ibadah. Every action of ibadah, every action of your heart can be traced back to murakhaba. So far we have spoken of two actions of the heart. One is sincerity, which is a class, and the other is certainty, which is yakin. Can there be sincerity if there is no murakhaba? if there is no watchfulness of Allah. When you are conscious of his watchful eye upon you, then ikhlas will sprout from you. You have to first believe that he is watching you, then to be sincere to your Rabb. Can there be certainty if you are not aware of his watchful eye? Each of these and the ones we will be talking about later springs out from the fountain of Murakhaba, fully knowledgeable and certain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is observing and you translate that theory into application. He watches me, he hears me, he sees me, it then affects my public and private affairs. Let us see what are the promises of our Rabb to those who are people of Murakhaba. This is not an action that you can see, taste, a smell or touch. It is something that you experience as a believer. Something sits in your heart, yet it is so dear to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it results in life-changing properties for those who achieve it in full or even a part of it. What will Allah award those of Murakhaba? For the Muslims of this century who have everything at their disposal, let us take about seven points which I will present here, inshallah. The first is Allah will award the people of Murakhaba with sovereignty on the land. He will establish them on the earth and they will be given victory and aid by their Rabb. What is the point of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to give Muslims authority and sovereignty over their affairs if they are going to backbite each other, kill each other, imprison and enslave one another? Here is a conversation between the prophets and the disbelievers in that era. As highlighted in Surah Ibrahim, Surah number 14, Ayah numbers 13 and 14. And those who disbelieved said to their messengers, Surely we shall drive you out of our land, or you shall return to our religion. So the Rabb inspired them. Truly, we shall destroy the Zalimun, the wrongdoers. And indeed, we shall make you dwell in the land after them. This is for him who fears standing before me that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the day of resurrection and also fears my threat, that is the threat of punishment. Who does this land belong to? For those who fear the standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fear the standing to give their account before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the Muslims who have muraqaba for whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the dunya as a byproduct. Till this is achieved, we will continue to see what we are seeing, what is happening over and over again, which is the deteriorating condition of the Muslims. When we have murakhaba, we are not only establishing our religion, but our dunya as well. It is your individual safety and the safety of the entire ummah. The next is, Allah gives the people of Murakhaba a taste of the flavor of Iman. That is a life-changing experience. Once you taste it, 
you will make the rest of your life chasing that experience again and again. There is a hadith which says, there are three characteristics, whoever attains them will experience the taste of Iman. The first is, whoever singles out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Tawheed, because La ilaha illallah. Not the worshippers of Jesus or Uzair or the worshippers of idols or people who follow their lusts and carnal desires etc. The next is a person who pays out zakah from his money agreeably. He is content with it. Not with lethargy, not with heaviness, but with happiness, love and enthusiasm. The next is a person who purifies himself. A person who goes through the process of tazkiyah. When the Prophet ﷺ was asked, what is this person who has tazkiyah? He ﷺ said, it is when a person realizes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with him wherever he goes. Though simple, how rare it is to find, find it among the people. The next is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shades the people of Muraqaba on the day of judgment. Subhanallah. Suppressing the heat of desires through their watchfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them shade on the day of judgment to cool them as an appreciation. We all know the famous hadith of the seven people who will be in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Most of them, if not all, share one thing in common. They are people of Muraqaba. There are seven categories of people who will be shaded on the day of judgment and when there is no shade but his. Let's see who they are. The just ruler, sovereignty in his, is in his hands, authority over the land is his. He need not be just, but he is just. Why? He has muraqaba. He knows that the watchful eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is upon him. And then a young man who grew up in the ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He suppresses all his base desires because of muraqaba. The next is a person whose heart is hung in the masjid. The Prophet ﷺ did not say a person who lives in the masjid or a person who is always in the masjid. But the heart is there waiting for every opportunity to go back. What is it that pushed him to the masjid at all, all the time? Murakhaba. And then there are two people who loved each other purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the sake of Allah, Muraqaba, they are doing it for him. And then you have a man who was seduced by a beautiful and high-ranking woman to fornicate and he said, I can't because I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is Muraqaba. Then a person who gives out charity so secretly that his left hand doesn't know what his right hand gave. Why? Because he is aware of the watchful eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muraqaba. A person who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all by himself or herself and the eyes begin to weep. What brought those tears? It wasn't an emotional nasheed. It wasn't looking at somebody else who was weeping. It wasn't a tragedy. Nothing induced those tears except his or her Muraqaba of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them the shade on the day of judgment? The next point is Allah gives them farasa. What is farasa? Farasa is an insight. It's like a sixth sense, an intuition. It is a sharp persuasion that penetrates the heart, dominates your opinion and overwhelms it. The same way a lion overwhelms its prey, dominates it, and gives it no chance of escape. We are in an era of hoaxes, scams, glittery, deceptions of the dunya. A believer is in need of this mechanism to see through this confusion. To see through, to see through clouds of ambiguity and to find what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala amidst all this mess. 
Allah gives them a way of discerning between right and wrong in a way that he doesn't give most of the other people. It's like a divine light that Allah casts into the heart of the believer. A sahabi said, his name is not being mentioned, I was walking to the masjid one day and my eye fell on a woman and I did not lower my gaze like I should have. I entered the masjid and Uthman who made an announcement. Why is it that one of you comes into the masjid and the traces of fornication are all over his eyes? This is what is called intuition. The Sahabi asked Uthman who is this the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after the Prophet He said no. This is not a revelation. This is true farasa. What do you know of Uthman Anhu? How shy was he of his Rabb? So shy as if the angels felt his shyness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they became shy of him. The Prophet sallallahu became shy of Uthman Anhu. A man of immense muraqaba. So Allah gave him this farasa. A scholar gives us a five-part recipe for farasa to be attained. One is, whoever lowers his gaze from the prohibited. The second is, prevents himself from falling prey to physical carnal desires. The third is, beautifies his inner state with muraqaba. The fourth is, beautifies his outer state with the sunnah. And the fifth is, gets used to consuming the halal. The fifth point I mentioned now is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards the people of Murakhaba with the love of the believers. Hide what you want, do what you want behind closed doors. If you insist upon it long enough, rest assured it's going to be made public. This applies to both good and the bad. People will sense a person of muraqaba and they don't know who, who that is so attractive about him, what it is so attractive about him or her from an Islamic perspective. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives love to this individual on the fact that he or she is a person of muraqaba when nobody else sees. Uthman Razila who said, anybody who has a secret in his heart, sooner or later it will come out from their facial expressions or the slip of their tongue. Imam Ibn al jawzi he mentioned, a person's private conduct, uh, conduct has a huge influence on how people see him in public. There is a huge link between where, what a person does in private and what people see them in public. Believers honor Allah Almighty and privacy and they leave a desire they really wanted to do out of a fear of Allah's punishment or out of hope in reward or out of just veneration of Him. They leave the wrong despite wanting it and despite the desire flowing through their veins. What happens as a result? It will be as if he has placed an incense stick on a live coal and ember and as a result a beautiful scent emanates that all of the people smell but they don't know where it is sourced. SubhanAllah. The moment you prevent yourself from doing something haram when no one is watching and you succeed in that battle that day, it is like your beautiful scent will now emanate from you and people will smell it. People will get attracted and they may see a light in you that you may not see in your mirror reflection and they do not know where the light is coming from. What is it that you do that makes you so special? You know, but they don't know. For some people, this scent will live on after they die. They are praised. People love them. They want to be near them. People want to remember their virtues. For some people, it will last for 100 days and then the scent will disappear. For others, probably for a year and then the scent will disappear. For others, it will remain with humanity till the end of time. 
all this based upon their conducting their affairs when no one else was looking. The sixth point I'm mentioning is the biggest feature and the most obvious gift to a person who becomes an individual of muraqaba. What is this? He or she is awarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an iron wall that stands between them and sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them so much strength to overcome the sins that other people are falling prey to because they are conscious of the watchful eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They fear, they feel the presence of their Rabb and it sprouts their manners and their adab. They have read in the Quran, in Surah Al-Alaq, Surah number 96, Ayah number 14, does he not know that Allah sees? And then in Surah Al-Ghafir, Surah number 40, Ayah number 19, Allah knows the fraud of the eyes and all that the breasts conceal. In Surah Al-Nisa, Surah number 4, Ayah number 108, they may hide that is their crimes from men, but they cannot hide them from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For he is with them by his knowledge when they plot by night in words that he does not approve. And Allah ever encompasses, encompasses what they do. And then if you go to Surah Al-Rad, Surah number 13, Ayah number 10, it is the same to Allah whether any of you conceal his speech or declare it openly, whether he be hid by night or go forth freely by day. In Surah Al-Mujadila, Surah number 58, Ayah number 7, Have you not seen that Allah knows whatsoever is in the heavens and whatsoever is on the earth? There is no Najwa, that is a secret council of three, but he is the fourth by his knowledge nor of five, but he is the sixth, nor of less than that or more, but he is with them wheresoever they may be. And afterwards, on the day of resurrection, he will inform them of what they did. Verily, Allah is the all-knower of everything. Look at this ayah, how very clearly they mention we cannot escape from the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at any time. Now here is a warning. Beware of making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the least significant of all observers. What do we mean by this? The very thought of somebody seeing your sin causes your hair to stand on end. Imagine somebody taps on your shoulder a few minutes into your deed and says, I'm sorry, I saw all of that. Or a conversation that you thought was genuine, it turns out that it was stepped. Or a long-term relationship which was haram, which you thought was genuine, and it is going somewhere, it turns out to be a setup. The big collision course when a scandal is coming in your way. The thought of being observed by humans during our times of heedlessness is scary, it is embarrassing and causes anxiety. To the extent that some people are observed by a child when they are doing a deed of this will leave them in embarrassment. They would wait until the child leaves. Can you imagine? Can it be that we have placed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the bottom of these all those observers? Beware of making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the least significant of all observers. If my Rabb says to me, were you not embarrassed to disobey me and you would hide sins from people, but you have no problem showing that to me? A famous poet said, if you find yourself alone and your soul is urging you to commit a sin during the evening, then be shy of the eye of Allah and say to the soul, the one who created the night can still see me. How many times have I found myself alone with the person whom I desire, but it is fear, my fear and shyness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that prevents me from making a move. Remember, sin is not what defines love. True love is not about committing a sin. 
What is the use of a pleasure if it ends up taking you to hell? Naudu billah. An iron wall stands between them and the sins is the greatest gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to a person who actualizes muraqabah. Aware of the eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the person is always in a state of internal conversation. Muraqaba is like a cloud that hovers over them wherever they go. Muraqaba is like a voice that speaks to them from within. Every time they tend to commit a sin, they hear that voice raising its tone and it says, O my soul, if you are about to commit this sin while thinking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot see you, then how severe is your disbelief in Allah? No, subhanallah. But O my soul, while you are doing the sin knowing that He can see you, then how little is your haya, how little is your shyness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? O oh my soul, why are you avoiding confrontation with these tough questions? When you know that the land is his, skies are his, sovereignty is his, and those limbs and parts of your body that you are using to disobey him are his alone? O oh my soul, how can it be that you have made Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the least significant over all observers? The last point, the seventh point is, the people of Murakhaba are also awarded with Jannah. That is where they will trust. Before that, for them it's a constant state of jihad. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanahu wa ta'ala so reassuringly said in one of the ayahs, Surah Al-Naziyat, Surah 79, ayah numbers 40 and 41, but as for, for he who feared the position of his Lord and prevented the soul from unlawful inclination, then indeed paradise will be his refuge. Who is this person who fears standing in front of his Rabb? Imam al-Qurtubi mentions in his tafsir, this is with reference to a person who is on the verge of committing a sin but remembers that he will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he walks away out of the fear of his Rabb. And as for he who fears the standing before his Rabb and prohibits his soul from it, then Jannah will be awarded to him. Having said all this, now, before we close this, what is the pathway to Muraqaba? Here are a few suggestions as to how I and you can work towards it. First and foremost is to know Allah. Remember, there is no potent way to attain the station of Muraqaba than to know who is watching and who you think about and give special attention attention to the study of his names and attributes. Focus on those specific names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will sprout muraqaba. Example, ar rahib the one who is watching. as samia the ever-hearing. Al-Basir, the ever-seeing. Al-Alim, the ever-knowing. Al-Latif, the subtle. The one who knows even the finest of details. Ash-Shaheed, the witness. Al-Muhit, the all-encompassing. And then watch how you will be forced into the medals of Muraqaba and to understand that this is the rub above me. Aisha Razala Anha said, once a woman named Khawla came to my house complaining to the Prophet about her husband, and she said, between me and her and the Prophet ﷺ, when she started complaining, was a gap of about one and a half meters. And her voice was muffled. I couldn't make out what she was saying. And it was then that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the ayah in Surah Al-Mujadila, surah, surah number 58, the first ayah. Indeed, Allah has heard the statement of her, referring to Khawla bin Ta'alaba that disputes, disputes with you, referring to Muhammad concerning her husband, whose name was Aus bin as -Samit, 
and complains to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah hears the argument between you both. Verily, Allah is all hearer, all seer. Aisha r.a. has said, Glory be to the one whose hearing encompasses everything. Between me and Khawla was a distance of a meter or so, and I could barely make out what she was saying, and Allah from above seven heavens hears the details of the conversation. Subhanallah. The next suggestion is, recite the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with contemplation, with tadabbur. One of the predecessors said, there, are, there were so many sins that I wanted to commit one night when no one was looking, but I was prevented each and every time when I remembered an ayah. Which is this ayah? You go to Surah Al-Rahman, Surah number 55, ayah number 46. But for him who the true believer fears, the standing before his rub, there will be two gardens. That is in paradise. So Quran is another shield from the temptations of those sins. The only condition is to recite the Quran with contemplation. Ponder over the Quran. The next point is to be aware of the consequences of abusing muraqaba. When you know the consequences of something, if it is not a carrot approach, it is of course a stick approach. If it is not the incentives that will help Murakhaba, let us understand at least the threats. What is in stock for somebody who crosses the limits of Murakhaba over and over again, boldly and audaciously? In one of the most terrifying ahadiths, the Prophet ﷺ said, I know certain segments of my ummah who will come with mountains of good deeds on the day of judgment and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will render all those good deeds into dust. They have nothing with Allah. Out of fear, the Sahaba asked the Prophet ﷺ to describe them, saying, lest we may be people of this without us knowing. The Prophet ﷺ said, they are your brothers, they are from your race, and they pray at night the same way you pray at night. However, there were people who, when they were alone, they would cross the limits of Allah. It is a terrifying reality to understand what it is not to be a person of muraqaba. If your life with all its good and bad details, righteous and unrighteous moments, were to put together as a film, tell me, would you watch it? Would you be comfortable watching it with your friends and loved ones? Would you be comfortable to have it broadcasted on national TV? This applies to me as well. The answer, of course, is no. And that is how I would answer that question to myself, as I told you. Be careful. You and I are authoring the script as we speak. Through our dress, through our business choices, through our relationships, how we present ourselves online, offline, what we sell, what we consume, what we inhale, etc. On the day of judgment, people will have to read out their own story. Go to Surah Al-Isra, Surah number 17, Ayah numbers 13 and 14. And we have fastened every man's deeds to his neck. And on the day of resurrection, we shall bring out for him a book which he will find wide open and it will be said to him, read your book. You yourself are sufficient as a reckoner against you on this day. You are enough as a reckoner against yourself. Naudu Billah. The next is, be aware of some of the stories of people of Muraqaba. I will share just a few of them. Abdullah ibn Dinar was traveling with Umar ibn, uh, ibn al-Khattab towards Makkah. He said, we camped in the latter part of the night and a shepherd came to us from a nearby hill with his sheep. Umar anhu told him, please sell me one of your sheep. The shepherd said, I am a slave. I don't have the authority to sell the sheep. Umar anhu wanted to test him. 
He told the shepherd, why don't you tell your master that the wolf came and ate one of the sheep? The shepherd gave a response that summarizes the purpose of every book of Aqidah that you may have studied. He gave a response, a very short, sharp response that caused Umar to weep. What was it? What did he say? He asked, then where is Allah? The very next day, Umar who made his way to the master of the slave and paid his price in full and set him free. In his farewell message, Umar who said, that word you used, you said yesterday has given you freedom in the life of this dunya. And I am hopeful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you, free, give you freedom on the day of judgment. Just think of this. Another incident. There was a woman who was abducted by a general who wanted to rape her. She was a righteous, God-fearing woman. Her neighbors came to try to defend her, but they couldn't do so because of the guards and soldiers who were defending this general. He took her into a room, closed the doors and began to entice her. She refused, saying, no, Allah is watching. Murakhaba. He did what most of the monsters would do. He began to force himself. Just before he started his devilish, demonic intent, she said, wait, wait, there is a door which you haven't closed. He asked, which door? She said, the door that was between you and Allah. He immediately moved away from her, said, excuse me, and he set her free. What is it that saved her? Her murakhaba. The Tabin al Rabia, a second generation Muslim, he didn't meet the Prophet, but he did meet the Sahaba. Ibn Masood told him that if the Prophet had seen you, he would have loved you. Al Rabia was a great worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his peers became jealous of him. They conspired to seduce him out of his iman. They spoke to a woman in the city who was known for her beauty and told her, we need you to tempt a Rabia out of his faith. She agreed, saying, no problem. One evening as he was coming out of the masjid, he saw her and she removed her niqab, that is the face cover. Narrators say her beauty was like a portion of the moon. A Rabia began to cry. She asked him, why are you crying? He said, I'm crying because I'm sad to see such beauty taking such a misguided part for it and then to be seen as a charcoal skull in the fire of hell. She covered her face, went to the masjid and became one of the famous worshippers. What saved her was the muraqaba. Ibn al-Qayyum mentions, there was a woman in Makkah who was looking into the mirror in her bedroom next to her husband. She said, do you think there is no one who would see this face and get tempted by it? Her husband said, yes, there is one guy. When asked, he said, Ubaid ibn Umar. Then she asked her husband, will you give me permission to try to seduce him? He said, yes, try. Imagine a husband saying this. Ubaid ibn Umar was in in the Kaaba, surrounded by students whom he was teaching. She came along and took him to a side of the masjid where there is a space and then she uncovers her face. She was described as a woman of immense beauty. He turned away and said, Bondswoman of Allah, behave yourself. She said, you tempted me so much. He understood what she is trying to do. He said, look, I have a few questions to ask you. If you are true in your response, I may consider fulfilling your request. She agreed. The first question was, if the angel of death was to come to you at this hour and your soul begins to shudder in its exit, will you be happy that I had fulfilled your regret request at this moment? She said, by Allah, I wouldn't. He said, I know you wouldn't. He then asked, tell me if you are entered into your grave and then the two angels enter your grave, they sit, they sit you up and begin the interrogation which would determine your future, would you be happy that I fulfilled your request? She said, by Allah, I wouldn't. He said, I know you wouldn't. 
He then said, tell me on the day of judgment, if you see the books of deeds lying around and you don't know whether you are going to catch your book in your right hand or left hand, would you be happy at that hour that I had fulfilled your request? She said, by Allah, I wouldn't. He said, I know you wouldn't. He asked, when you find yourself standing at the Sirat, the bridge that takes you over hell and towards paradise, you see people dropping into hell. Would you be happy to know that I fulfilled your request? She said, by Allah, I wouldn't. He said, I know you wouldn't. He said, tell me, if the scales are brought and you see the deeds of people being weighed and you don't know which side of the scales will weigh in your favor or against you, would you be happy that I fulfilled your request? She said, by Allah, I wouldn't. He said, I know you wouldn't. Finally, he said, tell me, when you stand in front of Al-Malik, the ultimate king, Al-Jabbar, and he asked you about all your deeds when you were alive, would you be happy to know what we, done, we had done here? She said, by Allah, I wouldn't. He said, I know you wouldn't. Then he told her, then have taqwa, fear Allah, because Allah has done good to you. He has not fallen short towards you. She got, uh, she got up and made her way back to her husband. Look at the husband. He asked, okay, how did it go? La hawla la khwata. He's wanting juicy gossip. She said, you are an idiot. We both are idiots. Then she started her salah. Then her fasting and ibadah. And the husband said, after this incident, I hate Ubaid ibn Umair. He has ruined my wife. Each night she was such a beautiful bride and now he has transformed her into a nun. These are some of the snapshots of Murakhaba that I wanted to share with you. As we tra traverse on a long journey of Murakhaba, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give me and all of you a healthy and wholesome portion of Murakhaba. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.